Hey, Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure, with chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. a real job today. I'm the control tower operator in a burlesque show. Control tower operator in a burlesque show? Yeah, I signal when the runway is clear for the next takeoff. <laughs> oh, I knew it would have to be a job around girls. <coughs> you can never stay away from girls, can you? No, gee, I was just thinking of my first girl. You were? Little Mary Buzzo. Buzzo. What a girl. Gorgeous. Charming. What a figure. I worshipped the ground she walked on. But one day I decided to give her up and break off our engagement. Why? Well, she had one little nasty habit I just couldn't stand. What was that? She'd never have anything to do with me. I... (laughs) Why didn't you give her something as a memento on your love? Why, when I married my wife, Betty, I gave her my else tooth. I know you did. Well, how did you know? I saw it when she smiled. I... (laughs) Listen, all the women in my family are smart girls. Why don't you marry my sister, Babe, Lou? <laughs> not me. Three of her husbands have all died under mysterious circumstances. That's not so, Costello. Well, all I know is that every time she gets married, the coroner gives her away. <laughs> Besides, marriage isn't for me. It's bad luck. Uh, how is marriage bad luck? Though? Well, take my Uncle Tom. He goes and marries my Aunt Eva. And two days later, he falls down an elevator shaft. Oh, wait a minute. You can't blame that on your Aunt Eva. No. Who do you think told him that it was the door to the broom closet? (laughs) Costello, where were you when they were passing out the brains? I was right there, but I thought they said pains, and I said I didn't want any. Oh, get them out! Oh, yes, the boys are on the beam tonight. And they'll be back on it in just about one minute. But first, let's hear this. so happy about? Well, I just got a birthday card from my insurance company. Well, that's nice. What does it say? It says, happy birthday to you through the coming year. As long as you're insured with us, there's nothing much to fear. So let the joyful bells ring out from Chicago to Nantucket. Happy birthday. You're all paid up in case you kick the bucket. You know, I didn't know today was your birthday, Costello. Oh, sure. You know, today is my birthday, too. How old are you now, Abbott? Uh, I'm 32. 32. Mm-hmm. Let's see, Abbott. If you're 32, according to my figures, you started working in burlesque two years before your father met your mother. I... <laughs> 
talk sense, Costello. I want to invite you to our party. You know, my wife's birthday is Saturday, and we celebrate both our birthdays together. Oh, so it's your wife's birthday, too. Uh-huh. Now, what kind of a present are you going to give her? Well, she loves to read books, but they have uh, quite an influence on her. Uh, just how do you mean? Well, <laughs> three years ago, I gave, a, gave her a copy of uh, Little Woman, and she presented me with a little girl. Two years ago, I gave her a copy of My Son, My Son. She presented me with a little boy. This year, I'm, I'm really worried. Why? She wants to read The Egg and I. <laughs> Abby, you better keep those egg jokes off the program. One of us is laying them around here enough. No, no, no. <laughs> Never mind. I want you to come to the party and bring that pretty red-headed manicure you've been running around with. Well, now, she's a honey, Abbott, but I don't think she likes me anymore. Well, what makes you think she doesn't like you, little? Well, she's been dropping a few, you know, veiled hints lately. Like, like what? Oh, slamming a door in my face. <laughs> Refusing to talk to me on the phone. Getting engaged to other guys. <laughs> really nothing you could put your finger on. No. <laughs> well, I don't blame her, Costello. She knows she'll never amount to anything. Everybody knows that. None of your family ever amounted to anything. Oh, no? Well, how about my Uncle Cassidy? My Uncle Cassidy? Who ever told him I had an Uncle Cassidy? <laughs> He's pretty famous. Your Uncle, Uncle Cassidy? No, my How Uncle How did he Cassidy. become famous? I don't know. I didn't even know I had Uncle Cassidy. <laughs> Your Uncle... How did he become famous, Lou? Well, he was the best grape crusher in France. He had seven toes on each foot and could crush more grapes than anybody in the vineyards. Is that so? Then one day, my father threw a handful of marbles in the grapes, and that made him famous. Well, how could that make him famous? From then on, he was known as Hopalong Cassidy. <laughs> you know, Lou, you know, it's a shame you don't have relatives like mine. I have a family that I can be proud of. My grandfather, Herman Abbott, was a very famous man. Uh, just what did he do? He drove all the Indians out of Pennsylvania. What program was he on? I... <laughs> And my uncle Anatole Abbott drove the first spike for the B&O. So what? My uncle Selson at Costello opened the first can of beans from the A.M.P. <laughs> and my wife, my wife is the most beautiful woman in North Hollywood. Are you kidding? Your wife is so knock-kneed that from the hips down she looks like a collapsible iron board. <laughs> Costello, how can you criticize my wife's figure? Did you ever see her in a bathing suit? Yes, I saw her at the beach last summer. Her bathing suit was so big that she got arrested for fishing with a net. <laughs> You're the most stupid man I ever met. Why don't you leave your brain to science? I might do that, Abbott. Last week, a scientist offered me $75 for my brain. Well, why didn't you take it? He wanted immediate delivery. <laughs> well, I'll see you later, Abbott. I've got to go out and hire a babysitter. A babysitter? Wait a minute. You haven't got any children. I know, but... <laughs> Where can I get a better date for 50 cents an hour? <laughs> Uncle Bud. Oh, hello, Uncle Bud. Hello, Uncle Bud, yeah. It's Abbott's nephew, folks. The Burt Lancaster of Orbach's basement. <laughs> What's on your mind, nephew Norman? <laughs> what is it, nephew Norman? <laughs> get a load of the way they talk to each other. Sounds like Guy Lombardo talking to Carmen. <laughs> Just ignore him, nephew Norman. Now, what were you going to say? Well, Uncle Bud, you know that friend of mine that owns that movie theater up in San Francisco? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Well, he's playing your latest picture, Abbott and Costello in Africa Screams. And after it opened last night, he had to put the ropes up. To hold the crowd back? No, two of the ushers wanted to hang themselves. (laughs) Hey, Abbott, why don't you keep that guy out of here? Norman happens to be a very smart boy, Costello. Why, when he was five years old, he was regarded as a boy wonder. So what? When I was five years old, I used to wonder what I was, too. (laughs) Hiya, fellas. Well, well, it's Matty Malnick, our band leader. Well, Matty Malnick, what's the idea of coming down here in a red sport coat, green slacks, pink shirt, purple tie, and black socks? Oh, I always wear black socks. Why? I don't want people to think I'm a loud dresser. (laughs) I must have read that wrong. You know... (laughs) You know, I'm kind of worried about Manly Costello. He's still single, you know. So what? Well, all the other band leaders are married. Look at Desi Arnaz. He's got his guitar and Lucille Ball. 
Harry James has got his trumpet and Betty Grable. So what? I got my fiddle and a life-size picture of Petrillo. <laughs> Wait a minute, Malik. I don't want you to come out and try to get funny with Abbott and I. I wouldn't think of it. That's better. You two guys have enough trouble trying to get funny by yourselves. Right. <laughs> One more crack like that, Malik, and I'll tell the laundry not to start your underwear. And you won't be able to stand... And you won't be able to stand up in front of that band. <laughs> oh, quit picking on Matty. <clears throat> That's right, bud. I've got to go anyway. I've got to buy the flute player a new flute. What's the matter with the flute he has now? Haven't you noticed? It's full of holes. <laughs> go on, Chubb. <laughs> so long, Matty. <laughs> nice boy, that Malik. I'd like to have known him when he was alive. <laughs> Hello, boys. Hello, Hello Viola. Oh, Viola Vaughn. Viola, you had a date with me last night and you didn't show up. Now, oh, I couldn't help it, Costello. You'll never break another date with me, Viola. I don't need to go out with you, you know. I can get a girl anytime I want. I'll show you I can get even. I, I can even get a girl to come up out of the audience. Now, if wait, I want. Now, wait a minute. This ought to be good. No, oh, I could. I could. Just I could. Minute, I could just just a girl just a minute. Come up. All right, go ahead, Costello. Let's see you get a girl out of the audience. Okay. All right, come on. Is there a beautiful young lady out there that would like to go out with me tonight? Just come up here on the stage. <laughs> come on. Just a minute, Mr. Costello. You know you can't do that. You know that no girl will come up here out of the audience. And why not? For this program, the ABC Network straps the audience in their seats. <laughs> Yes, see, wise guy? Now, aren't you sorry you spoke that way to Viola? Well, Viola, if you'll go out with me tonight, I'll take you to some nice, quiet spot, and I'll help you work out your problems. Well, I haven't got any problems. Well, you haven't been out with me yet. <laughs> Costello, why don't you take Viola up to Lover's Lane on Lookout Mountain? Oh, yes. yes. That, that would be nice. Oh, nothing doing. Nothing doing. No, no. My brother Pat took a girl up there last night, and he was sitting in a car, necking, and a cop stuck a flashlight in the car and said, you can't neck with girls up here. What did your brother Pat do? He says, wait a minute, officer. This happens to be my wife. I'll bet the cop was surprised when he found out it was your brother Pat's wife. So was my brother Pat. He didn't know it either until the flashlight went on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Costello. If you promise to give up the life you're living, I may reconsider and marry you. That would be wonderful. Yes. We'll have a little honeymoon cottage, and the stork may drop in on us. Oh, boy. Yes, and every so often, a little bundle will be left on our doorstep. Oh, that's okay with me. That diaper service sure saves a lot of work. <laughs> Costello, you can't marry Viola until you get some money. Well, it won't be long now. I just bought some oil in in Texas. <laughs> yeah, me and shotgun. <laughs> and I'm going down there to drill for oil tomorrow. Oh, that's wonderful, Costello. And just remember while you're down there, my heart will be with you in Texas. My soul will be with you in Texas. And my mind will be with you in Texas. Okay. And if I strike oil, I'll send for the rest of you. <laughs> oh, get him out of here! And as the plot thickens, we'll ring down the curtain of the nonsense just long enough to bring you this message. week at this time, the Abbott and Costello Show presents our feature singer, and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Hal Winters, with Maddie Malnick and his orchestra. (laughs) 
If you ever go across the seas to Ireland Then maybe at the closing of your day You will sit and watch the moon rise over Clada And see the sun go down on Galway Bay Just to hear again the ripple of a trout stream The women in the meadows making hay And to sit beside a turf fire in the cabin And watch the barefoot gossoons at their play Or the breezes blowing o'er the seas from Ireland Are perfumed by the heather as they blow And the women in the uplands digging praties Speak a language that the strangers do not know For the strangers came and tried to teach us their way They scorned us just for being what we are But they might as well go chasing after moonbeams Or light a penny candle from a star And if there is going to be a life hereafter And somehow I am sure there's going to be I will ask my God to let me make my heaven In that dear land across the Irish Sea All right, come out here, Costello. Who are you talking to on the phone? My Aunt May. They just brought her home from the hospital. She was expecting a baby. And she said them hospitals, that they run them just like radio quiz shows. Well, what did she mean? Well, before they would give her the baby, she had to guess if it was a boy or a girl. <laughs> what happened? Aunt May guessed it was a boy. The doctor says, no, guess again. So she says, it's a girl. The doctor said, no, guess again. <laughs> Well, what was it? We don't know. Aunt May didn't hang around long enough to find out. (laughs) The cutest nurse came home with Aunt May to take care of her. Boy, what a nurse. Is she fussy? Uh, Wait a minute. I hope you're not going to start chasing the new nurse. (laughs) I already did have it. But she's too fussy for me. Last night she said she wouldn't kiss me unless I shaved. She she likes a guy to have a smooth face. Did you shave? Three times. (laughs) Then I took her to the movies. I'll never do that again. Why? My face was so smooth. Every time she tried to kiss me, she slid right past me and kissed the guy in the next seat. (laughs) Never mind that. What is your Sam Shovel detective story about tonight? Abbott, tonight I do one of my most famous cases. I call it the case of the thief who stole the hamburgers from the lunchroom, or he was a short-order crook. Sounds very tasty. Let's do it. Right. Yes, I'm Sam Shovel. (laughs) Sam Shovel, private detective. And I'm ashamed of myself today. Today I arrested my own brother. I'm a rat. I'm a heel. I'm a louse. I decide to hit myself in the jaw. (laughs) I don't take that kind of talk from nobody. Not even myself. This detective business will drive a guy nuts. This morning, Jaime the stool pigeon gave me some information. He told me not to let the cat out of the bag and to keep it under my hat. I may have to disappoint Jaime. It's getting mighty uncomfortable having a cat in a bag sitting on top of my head. (laughs) Well, it's time to feed him a pet frog. There's something wrong with this frog. He ain't croaked in three days. He must have a man in his throat. (laughs) I decide to open my mail. Here's an invitation to a barn dance. 
I don't think I'll go. Ain't much fun dancing with a barn. Here's a card from one of my old flames, Polly the Pickpocket. What a girl. I'll never forget the night she put her arms around me. I lost all sense of time. I couldn't help it. She stole my watch. <laughs> Here comes my secretary. She's been running in and out of the office all day. Each time she kisses me. Oh, there you are, Sam. I'm going to kiss you again. Oh, you sweet thing. <laughs> I'm having a very busy day. <laughs> I'm up to my work and neck. <laughs> that secretary is a high-class kid. I practically snatched her from a finishing school. She was a carpenter's helper, and she was busy finishing a school. <laughs> oh, well, one thing I can say for myself. I ain't the kind of a boss who chases his secretary around the office. I chased her in the hall. <laughs> Before I hired this girl, I had a Ubangi as a secretary. She was the only secretary I ever met who could seal the envelopes after she put them in the mail chute. <laughs> I glance out of the office window. There's my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad, coming down the street. He walks straight and erect. That's a holdover from his military days. Abbott was in the service. Abbott was a colonel. Abbott became a colonel the hard way. The hard way, he was in the Navy. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott has been my friend for years. It's a peculiar friendship. First he blows hot, then he blows cold. He ain't much of a friend, but he works out swell as an air conditioning unit. <laughs> I'll never forget the day Lieutenant Abbott got married. His wife, Betty, was an opera singer. She sang like a bird, but she was a flop. Very few people would <laughs> would pay to hear a woman go tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> what a woman that Mrs. Abbott is. She comes from very fine stock. Too bad she didn't come from people. <laughs> Hello, Sam Shovel. It's my pal, Lieutenant Abbott. And you look tired, Lieutenant. I am, Sam. All day I've been trying to locate a gorgeous six-foot blonde with blue eyes and a lovely figure. I've had the whole police department looking for her and... Lieutenant Abbott, maybe I can bring her in. What's the charge? You bring her in. I'll think of something. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott must have paid the writer. Sam, you're slipping. Why, there's talk around town that you're not a good detective anymore. Is that so? Give me a good case and I'll solve it quicker than you can say Jerk Robinson. No, not Jerk Robinson. That's Jack Robinson. The Robinson I know is a jerk. <laughs> Sam, you've been pulling a lot of bonus lately. On the McGurk jewelry robbery, you arrested McGurk, but you didn't find the jewels. Well, that's no skin off my nose. And last week, I asked you to watch a prisoner for me and let him escape. That was no skin off my nose. And when you investigated the hole up in the butcher shop on the corner, you backed into the slicing machine. That was no... <laughs> that was a little trouble. <laughs> That's not all. The traffic department is uh, complaining about you. The way you dra drive around town in that prowl car of yours is positively dangerous. That's not so. Yesterday at Hollywood and Vine, I slowed down to give a pedestrian the right of way. You did? Of course, he was in an ambulance at the time. <laughs> Enough of this chat, Sam. I'm on an important case. I'm after Light Fingered Lil, the lady bank burglar. Light Fingered Lil. I know her well. You do? Sure, her well is in back of her house. <laughs> I always stop there for a drink of water. That girl is a clever crook. Today, she went into the First National Bank and grabbed a teller. She hugged him and kissed him, and while she was doing that, she took all the money out of his cash drawer. She does that every day. Hey, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You mean that she goes into the same bank every day and hugs and kisses the teller and then robs him? Yes. Why, why don't the president of the bank do something about it? He did. He's quitting his job to become a teller. I... <laughs> Sam, we've got to nab Lil. She's public enemy number seven. Not no more. Now she's public enemy number one. How did that happen? Walter Winchell gave her a plug Sunday night. <laughs> well, that does it, Sam. Lil has a map of the spot where she's buried all her loot. And you and I are going over there and get it. I'm glad you said that, Lieutenant. Why? If you didn't, we'd have no story. <laughs> 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 Lieutenant Abbott, 
Lieutenant Abbott and I arrived at Lil's hideout. I knocked on the door. I rang the bell. <laughs> Make up your mind. I'd like to get in there while I'm still young. <laughs> the door opened and there stood Lil. She spoke. Well, well, if it ain't Slewfoot. What's on your mind, copper? I like the way you talk, Lil. You're my type of woman. What makes you say that, Sam? You're living. <laughs> and you're beautiful. There's such a delightful aroma about you. Is that taboo, perfume I smell? It is, and you do. <laughs> Sam, we're getting no place fast. Make love to her. Make love to her, Sam. Maybe she'll soften up and g give us the map. Lil, you're the kind of a girl I could go for. I'd walk to the three corners of the earth for you. But, Sam, there are four corners to the earth. Yes, but who wants to get near Russia? <laughs> Sam, step over here. I want, I want a word with you. Sam, she's got that map here someplace. It may be in, the, in that table. I'll hold her and you look for it. It may be in her pocketbook. I'll hold her and you look for it. Then it may be in the top of her stocking. Then you hold her and I'll look for it. <laughs> hold everything. Hold everything. I see it. It's on top of the piano. I got it, Sam. Come on, we're getting out of here. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott and I got a shovel. We started digging for the buried loot. Sam, I've been digging for the past hour. Are you sure you followed the map correctly? Yes, it says here, take two steps forward. Then one to the left. Then two steps backward and one to the right. Then turn and take two steps to the left and two to the right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that map. There it is. You idiot. That's not a map. That's a rumble lesson from Arthur Murray. <laughs> hey, hey, get me out of here. Keep the house lights down, boys. We'll have a curtain call from Abbott and Costello after a final reminder on this subject. just have time to remind the folks about the big championship fight here in Los Angeles, May 26th. Folks, Ike Williams, the world's lightweight champion, and Enrique Belenis are fighting April 26th for the lightweight championship of the world. It's a fight for kids. The money will go to help fight juvenile delinquency through the Lou Costello Jr. Youth Foundation. Be sure to see this uh, great fight, folks. And remember to listen to the Abbott and Costello show next Thursday. Our writing staff is headed by Eddie Foreman with Paul Conlon, Pat Costello, Martin Ragaway, and Len Stern. And our producer is Charles Vander. Good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Patterson. Good night. Good night. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show. This is transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station.